Have you been thinking about different things as Christmas approaches? We should, because, you know, when Jesus came, it changed everything. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. His birth changed everything. And we'll talk about the different things right in the text. We're going to read the Christmas story out of Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 20. And there's more to the story than that, I realize, but this is probably the most well-known, and it's the one that I remember as a child. So let's begin with verse 2, or verse 1 of Luke chapter 2. Could you quote it? You almost could, couldn't you? And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord had made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. I know you've heard that many times, but it's like hearing it for the first time. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time now as we consider what your word says about your son. Help us see that. Help us understand that and help us get the word out that Jesus changes everything. Help us do that, we pray in his name. Amen. Today is the last Sunday before Christmas Day in the year 2021. I know some of you are saying, I never thought I would live this long. And that's okay. We will have a Christmas Eve service at 7 this Friday, and I pray you can come and be a part of this special evening together. But today we're going to look again at the birth of Jesus Christ and perhaps see something we haven't seen before. And yes, it is a time of joy and celebration. It's a time to get together with family and we exchange gifts to remember the gift God gave us in His Son. However, our culture seems to place too much emphasis on gifts and the giving of them rather than on the reason for this time of year. And folks, if you want to change that, change it. Start with you. Start with me. Because you see, Christmas is not about 
giving or receiving gifts. If we make it just about that, we miss the meaning of it. This season becomes one of buying and selling rather than reflecting on the birth of Jesus Christ. Let's face it, our children, if they're like mine and like my grandchildren, they get just about anything they want all year long. I didn't hear an amen, but that's okay. Buying and selling. Reminds me of Jesus running the money changers out of the temple. And you see, if our children get about anything they want, we adults are the same, aren't we? Any gift giving we're involved in ought to be very special because Jesus is very special. And a gift should reflect this. A lot of people at this time of the year experience stress caused by gift purchasing. Well, that's unfounded, and it shouldn't be. More than a gift under the tree is when our spouse tells us this, well, if you want that, let's just go buy it together. An unexpected gift or an expected gift is not as special as one that was not expected. When Jesus came, most were not expecting him. There were no crowds at the manger that night. They surely were not expecting him to be born in such a place like that, stable in a manger. But you see, Jesus coming as a baby has changed everything. Now think about what I just read. If someone asked you in June, who was Caesar Augustus, what would come to your mind? Well, he was the emperor of Rome when Jesus was born. You know how I know anything about Caesar Augustus? Because Jesus was born when he was the emperor. We remember this governor named Quirinius. It means little or nothing to us unless it's attached to the birth of Jesus. So his birth has changed the way we view many things. Let's consider how the birth of Jesus has changed the way we view events in history. There are three areas that Jesus' birth has changed our views. I pray this will help us celebrate Jesus' birth in a more proper fashion. Let's begin with the first area. In verses 1 to 7 of Luke chapter 2, Jesus' birth has changed the way we view God's dominion. We often get this backward. And it's easy to do. We think that God planned for Jesus to come during the reign of Augustus. But God planned for Augustus to be governor when Jesus came. We think the census was the reason for Joseph going to Bethlehem. But Joseph went to Bethlehem in order to fulfill prophecy. We think that Joseph and Mary, or we might think that they were not married at this time, but according to Matthew's gospel, when they got to the manger, they were married. And we often think that after everything was said and done, Jesus was born, after they had gone to Egypt, and waited till Herod died, and then they came back, and they decided to live in this town called Nazareth. But if you remember when we read it, that Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth. That's where they lived before. So the thing is, sometimes we get things backward when we look at God's dominion over mankind. Because you see, his dominion has to do with his rule over all things. And that includes the Roman government. You will notice the details in Luke's description. And of course, God's dominion includes all the rulers who were in place when Jesus was born, of course. But notice his description. There was a decree... And if you remember, even in the Old Testament, a decree is a law that is basically written in stone. It cannot be changed. It must be followed. And Augustus, of all the Caesars, was known for census taking. He did this three times in his reign. 
But notice also the trip to Bethlehem. Notice the detail in where Joseph was from. Galilee was the area. Nazareth was the city. Judea was the area surrounding Bethlehem. And Bethlehem, of course, was the city of Joseph's lineage because he was of the house of David. Now, what does that tell us? Just those things there. What tribe was David a part of? The tribe of Judah. And Joseph was being of that same tribe and when it came time for this, some translations say census, because that's basically what was going on. This Caesar Augustus counted people so he would know how much tax money he got. Very similar to our alphabet agency today, the IRS. If you think you can make money and them not know about it, you need to live on a desert island with no cell phone. So Bethlehem was the city of Joseph's lineage. It's called here in the text, and it's called in other places the city of David. But notice also the care that Mary showed her firstborn. We know this. We've heard it many times. She wrapped him in swaddling cloths. What in the world is that? Well, it's strips of cloth, and you wrap the baby in those so that he or she feels safe and secure. They do that today. They did that when my children were born. Wrapped them up tight. So when they came to pick them up out of the nursery and bring them to mom, they had to unwrap them. Almost like a present. It didn't make the same kind of noise. But wrapping newborn babies is still done today. And I just, as an aside, my little... Uh, Female dachshund is about this long. Her name is Molly. When she goes to sleep, she wants to be snuggled. If she's not snuggled, she's not happy. And babies are the same way. It gives them a sense of security when they're wrapped snugly. And that's exactly what Mary did to Jesus. And then what does it say next? She laid him in a manger or a feed trough. Now, folks, don't get the wrong idea. There wasn't feed in there. It was cleaned out. If Mary was a mother of any kind, she would have done her very best, pregnant or not, to make this stable as clean as possible. And I just imagine she told Joseph, you better help me with this. Yep. So clean or dirty, Jesus was laid in a manger. And as I mentioned last week, uh, God the Father knew his son would not be touched by disease. Do you realize if Jesus walked here today that he wouldn't have to be vaccinated at all? Period. And in his walk, and we read that through the rest of the Gospel of Luke and the other Gospels, in his walk he would rub shoulders with sinners. Can you imagine the massive crowds that surrounded Jesus? Him being the center and them all around Him. You remember when that lady touched his, the, the hem of His robe and Jesus turned and said, Who touched me? And the disciples probably snickered. Everybody's touching you. What do you mean? No. She touched me with a touch of faith. So Jesus rubbed shoulders with sinners and publicans and bad people, uh, by the way, if you don't know anything about fishermen, and I'm not talking about guys like me that go every once in a while, I'm talking about guys that go every day to make a living. You don't know anything about them? They don't always smell the best. They really don't. And that, folks, that's not a bad thing. I've had many a, a professional, or not, not a professional, but a fisherman who did that for a living tell me that's the smell of money. So Jesus would grow to rub shoulders with some pretty colorful characters but never become a sinner. Don't forget that. But let's go on. There's more. 
Number two, God, uh, Jesus' birth has changed the way we view God's communication. How does God speak to us? How does God speak in the past? And that's in verses 8 to 14. According to the writer of Hebrews, God spoke in the past in many different ways. Now you just think about that. Sometimes we're not told how God spoke. He must have spoke audibly or through the mind to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He inspired David and others to write the Psalms. He spoke in dreams to kings and Daniel gave the interpretation. And God spoke through the birth of Moses to give us a precursor for the birth of Jesus Christ. Did you ever realize that? There are a lot of similarities between the birth of Moses and the birth of Jesus. You don't believe me? Okay. Think of this. Both were born to parents of humble means. Joseph and Mary were not wealthy. Even later on when the wise men came and brought gold. Folks, how much gold do you think they brought? Everybody thinks, oh, they must have loaded a camel down with it. No. No. Probably just a small handful. It was not enough to make Joseph and Mary wealthy. They were parents of humble means. And if you know anything about the parents of Moses, it was the same thing. They were in captivity not to Rome, but to Egypt at the time Moses was born. Uh, both of them, Jesus and Moses, were born with a ruler wanting to kill them. Yep. What did Pharaoh say? He told the midwives, the Hebrew midwives that were helping deliver these babies, well, if it's a male, you kill him. Well, <laughs> that didn't work. And when he found out they weren't doing it, he said, well, did you not hear what I said? Yeah, but these, these Hebrew women are so robust, they have the child before we even get there. Of course, who was it that wanted to kill Jesus? Herod. And both, Moses and Jesus, were saved by being in or going to Egypt. Moses was saved out of the river by the daughter of Pharaoh, raised in Pharaoh's household. Folks, if that's not ironic, I don't know what is. This boy that the Pharaoh wanted to kill was raised in his own household. And of course, Jesus, with Mary and Joseph, went to Egypt to escape the wrath of Herod until he died. But then both Jesus and Moses were born to be a deliverer. Now Moses is going to deliver his people from bondage to Egypt. Now Jesus didn't come to deliver his people from bondage to Rome. He came to deliver his people from bondage to sin. And he does that. Moses delivered from Egyptian slavery. Jesus delivered and does from slavery to sin. You see, the Bible claims to be the Word of God. That is a question you don't have to ask it. The Bible claims to be the Word of God. Thus says the Lord appears many times in Scripture. It is God's way of showing us much about ourselves and much about Him that we would not otherwise know. Notice how God spoke to the shepherds right here. The text says they were in the same country. Now oftentimes when we think of that, we're thinking of the nation of Israel. Well, that's not what it means. Not the nation of Israel, but the same region as Bethlehem. They were outside the city of Bethlehem. They were watching sheep during the night. And notice the text says they were living out in the field. They stayed there with the sheep. That was their job. So they were watching the sheep during the night. Now no doubt these guys would doze off. If you've ever had to work night shift at any job, 
Folks, I'm just not meant to stay up all night. It's not the way I'm made. Now maybe some, I know children think they are, but when they get older and they get a job, they realize they're not. So here they are watching their sheep, and I'm sure they could have been talking. We don't know exactly what time it was. It, the text does not say. When what happened? A single angel came and announced the birth of Jesus Christ. And notice how Luke describes him. Not the angel of the Lord, but an angel of the Lord appeared and stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. Well, the angel came and stood. That means he came to the earth. I know a lot of pageants had the angel up in the air. That's not what the text says. Many times we get that wrong. But anyway, the point is this angel came and the area lit up with the glory of the Lord. And what does it say? They were greatly afraid. I think the King James says that they were sore afraid. I'm from the south. They were surely afraid. It frightened them just practically almost to death. That's what we would say. His appearance frightened them because it's night. It's dark. There's no one there. There's If they had any light, it would have been a campfire maybe, but it doesn't even say that. His appearance frightened them. And what does he tell them? Fear not. That ought to give you a clue who this angel is. He's the same one that appeared to Mary and Joseph and told them you're going to have a child. And he's not going to be yours, Joseph. He's going to be God's. But he'll come through the natural process, the natural birth process, and you'll call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So he tells them to fear not. This is most likely, the text doesn't say, most likely the angel Gabriel. Every time Gabriel appears, he frightens people. But the first words out of his mouth is, don't be afraid. That's probably a good thing. Fear not. The message that he brings is to all kinds of people, especially these shepherds. The Christ, the Messiah, had been born. They knew about the Messiah. They had heard about him since they were very young. And so they knew something about him. And the angel said he's in a stable in Bethlehem, wrapped in in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Well, right, right, that right there ought to tell you he'd be pretty easy to find. How many children would be in a manger? But that's not all. Suddenly, suddenly there was an army of angels appeared with the first name. Notice it says the heavenly hosts, a multitude of the heavenly hosts. The word host there has to do with an army. Now think about that. All of a sudden with this single angel, an army of angels appear and what are they doing? They're praising God. They're not fighting they're praising God. That's unusual for an army. Well, it's unusual for most armies. They praise God by, and I emphasize this because I don't want you to get the wrong idea, by saying, not singing. Folks, there's nothing wrong with angels singing, but how many times do angels sing? We're the ones that do the singing. And what did they say? Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now some people have looked at that and said that's just wrong because there is no peace. Isn't that what Longfellow said in his song? I heard the bells on Christmas Day. 
There is no peace on earth, I said. Yeah, there is. Who is it with? The NIV says something different here, and I think it's more correct and more literal. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. This one that Isaiah called the Prince of Peace would come and he would bring peace between men who loved one another because of Jesus Christ. That's the idea. That's the 2011 version of the NIV. So God announced the birth of His Son by angels. He didn't write cute little invitations and have them sent out all over Israel saying, my son is going to be born. No, he did something much more spectacular. He announced Jesus' birth by angels. But to whom did he announce this? Shepherds. Shepherds. You say, well, what's wrong with shepherds? Nothing. A Philip Keller was a shepherd who wrote several books, a Christian man who wrote books about sheep and how when Jesus called a sheep, that Philip said, I know exactly what he's talking about. It was back during the Depression when Philip got his first group of ewes, that's female sheep. And he and another fellow were sitting on the, uh, not the gate, but the, uh, the corral on the top post and just looking at them. And he said, I have worked hard and I saved my money to get these sheep. And his friend looked at him and he said, well, Philip, they're now yours. You've got to mark them. So he took a knife and he notched the ear of every one of his sheep. That way he knew they were his. To read his books is an exercise in learning more about ourselves. He said this, and I'm, I'm not going to tell you all that he said because there's a lot to it, but he said that often, and this was out in the Wyoming area where he lived, that wolves and mountain lions would often come and try to get the sheep. And he said when they got upset, they would bleat. They would make their nah noise. You know what I'm talking about. That's the closest I can come to that. But anyway, he said they would get upset, and he always slept with a 303 British rifle close to him. And he said when they started getting upset, I would go outside and he said, it was so amazing. He said, I would walk amongst my sheep and it would calm them right down. I thought, yes, sir. Lord Jesus, you come right down here and walk and we'll calm right down. We certainly will. So God announced the birth of His Son by angels. Now, folks, you don't need an angel today to tell you anything. Some people have little things on their dash, you know, I've got a, uh, what do they call them, guardian angel. Well, maybe you do. Maybe you need it. I don't know how reckless you drive. You know, maybe you do. But the point is, we don't need angels to tell us anything today. We have the completed Word of God. If you want to know what God says, read His Word. But let's go on. There's one more. Number three. Jesus' birth has changed the way we view God's compassion. And that's talking about the shepherds in verses 15 to 20. God announced Jesus' birth to shepherds first. First. He didn't tell anyone else until these shepherds heard. Now, if you don't know anything about shepherds, they're much like fishermen. But even worse, in Israel especially, they were the lowest class of people. If you were a shepherd, that was as low on the totem pole as you could get. And even though sheep were needed, their caretakers were considered low class. But why would God announce this to shepherds? Why would He not tell kings and priests well, we do know that one king found out about his birth and tried to kill him. The shepherds certainly didn't do that. God didn't announce Jesus' birth to kings. 
So the shepherds in the text here decide to go to Bethlehem and see this wonderful thing. And notice, there's no fanfare, there's no gifts that they bring. They just simply come to the stable and see this child. And what did they do? They left there and notice verse 17. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. What was told them by the angel? This is the Messiah. This is the Christ. This is the anointed one. They became the very first evangelists. They told everyone they saw about the birth of Jesus. And what God had shown them about Him. Now this is before Jesus became a man. This is before He would die for sinners. This was before He would do miracles. Before He would walk on the water. This is just a baby. Just been born. Very small. But they told everyone they met about what they had seen. And notice, all who heard it wondered, well, or marveled. What does that mean? That word simply means that they were amazed, not just curious. It amazed them. But Luke also adds something that I think is very important in verse 19. But Mary, his mom, kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. What did she keep? What did she, what's the idea behind keep? It means to treasure. She would remember this. And this is before cell phones, folks. This is before cameras. She couldn't take pictures of, uh, Joseph, you remember the sheep over there in the corner when Jesus was born? You know, they didn't have pictures. She kept all these things and treasured them in her heart. This means she remembered what had happened and thought about it often. Lord, she kept it in the front of her mind. And what's amazing is, hold your finger there and flip over to the very first chapter, verses 1 and 2 and 3. Notice what Luke begins with. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. What does that mean? Well, if you go to the first chapter in the book of Acts, which Luke wrote also, you'll find something similar. And Luke said, basically, I consulted with people who saw all of this happen. And that's what he did. Why would he even mention Mary? She was one of the ones he went to. She told him about the birth. He wasn't there. No wonder Luke would consult with her before writing his gospel. And notice he tells us that he carefully laid out his gospel in an orderly account. He consulted with eyewitnesses and there were times that Luke was actually there. Therefore, folks, this is what actually happened. I hope you believe that. (coughs) So she remembered, Mary remembered, But so many forget. That's where we are today. I grew up in a period of time, especially when I was in junior high school and high school. Uh, I know many people probably here today grew up listening to Conway Twitty and Roy Acup and little Jimmy Dickens and people like that that sang country music that had been gone a long time. And I remember coming up to the Ishtuckney River 
on Thanksgiving weekend and hunting squirrel and fishing and eating like, well, I don't want to tell you anything about that. But I remember Dad had bought a transistor radio. Well, he had got my uncle, who was in Germany, to pick him up a transistor radio in Germany. It was about this wide, about that thick, and about this tall, and it had an antenna that flipped up. And he would set it somewhere around the camp and find somebody that had the Grand Ole Opry on. And that's how I, that's what kind of music that I grew up with. But when I got older, and I'm not saying anything against country music, but I listened to other types of music. I listened to rock and roll. And there was a band that came out, for, I think, in the Pittsburgh area. You correct me if I'm wrong. Do it after. So. Uh, the band was called Journey. And the singer for Journey was Steve Perry. Steve Perry had one of the greatest voices, I think, that a man can have. He could hit high notes that I can't even think about. I can't even write them. Well, Steve left the band, I don't know how many years ago, and it was just after the death of his girlfriend a couple of years ago that he started writing songs again. And he decided to write a Christmas, or put out a Christmas CD. And folks, this shows you the depth of depravity into which our society has fallen. None of the songs on that CD mention Jesus or his birth. None. If you go to Rural King, and I suggest you do, they don't pay me for that, but I really like that store. You'll notice if you listen, you will hear not only Christmas music, you will hear Christian music. One of the reasons I like to go there. It's refreshing to enter a secular store, one that you know has nothing to do with the church and hear Silent Night. Because Christmas without Jesus Christ is a contradiction. And yet many are there today. What about you? What's your reason for celebrating Christmas? Christmas? Is it to get together with family and friends or is it to exchange gifts with those you love? Now this is not bad. I'm not telling you to quit that because I don't have any, I'm going to do the same thing. But it assumes that this holiday is just another time to get together, eat, and have fun together. Because we do similar on July the 4th, don't we? Maybe the food's different. If we do not teach our children the true meaning of Christmas and model it for them, they will grow up thinking Christmas is just another holiday like July the 4th. We haven't done this. We haven't started this tradition in our family, but I want to do that this Christmas because we will be at home. I want to read the Christmas story. So that we get our minds in the right place. And when we open these gifts and it's a surprise, something we would have never imagined that we would have, then we'll think of the shepherds that night when that announcement was made to them. If we remember that the gifts under the tree are there to remind them of the birth of Jesus, then we've done our job. God's unspeakable gift. And when their focus turns to Jesus rather than Santa Claus, we can believe they're on the right track. What will your children think of when they realize that Santa is just a historical figure and in many ways mythical? Up, say, Keith Jones is not a believer. I am, but I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Because if you think about it, and your children and grandchildren know it, he really can't go down a chimney. Especially if there's fire in it. Or drive a sleigh of reindeer in the air. 
or visit every home on earth in one night. We know that, but do we teach our children that Jesus' birth is what Christmas is all about? And she's not in here. And Debbie struggled with making a mailbox so that children could write letters to Santa. And the Brantford, not Brantford, but the O'Brien Post Office said, yeah, we do that all the time. You send them over here, we'll stamp them like they have actually been sent. And then you do whatever you want to with them after that. Well, she struggled making this mailbox, and Michael and I kind of laughed at her because it didn't look very good. It was an ugly mailbox, I'll put it like that. But the interesting thing, and I think one of our members brought that to her attention just last week, it gives children a false sense of reality. Because one of those children in their letter to Santa asked for a mom. Hope Santa ain't going to bring you no mom. And to give them a, a false sense of thinking that he would I don't think Santa could provide that. So I was kind of overjoyed, Amanda, the other night when I loaded that up on the top of the golf cart because we didn't drive the truck down here and I took it to the burn pile and I set it on fire. Because we certainly do not want children to think that Santa can do the impossible. Only God can do the impossible. He did that when he sent Jesus to earth to live a life without sin and die for sinners like you and me. What was not possible under the old covenant is now possible under the new. You realize what he has changed about the way people approach God? In the Old Testament, how did you approach God? You took your sacrifice and you went to the priest. You killed it. He took blood. would go into the Holy of Holies, sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. And that was as close as you got to God. What happened when Jesus came? According to the writer of Hebrews, and I love the book of Hebrews, he has made a way into the holiest for anyone who will believe that Jesus is the Christ. We can now approach the throne of God in Jesus' name because of what He has done for us. Do you realize how important? Do you think you could go to Washington right now and say, because I'm an American citizen, I'd like to talk to Mr. Biden? You realize the hoops you'd have to jump through in order to get an audience with the President of the United States, but according to Scripture, you can go right into the throne room of God and have an audience with the Creator of all things. And all He asks of us, after knowing what we know about Him and His Son, just tell the message to everybody that you can it's good news. Tell everyone because it's good news. That ought to be our prayer this Christmas. I have written in my journal several times, Lord, give me boldness. Help me remember when I'm alone with someone that I don't know for whatever reason, be a nurse or a doctor or whoever, to not be quiet about my faith. That's all he asks. Tell this story to everyone we can. I pray we will not be silent. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for Jesus Christ who changes the way we do everything. And Lord, I realize there's a lot of things that we do today that when Jesus was here was not possible. Jobs, vocations 
and things like that, Father, that, that exist today that did not exist back then. And that's understandable. But Lord, help us to realize that Jesus changes the way we approach you. I can now, in front of this congregation, pray to you, and the Holy Spirit takes my prayer and interprets it before the throne of God so that your will is prayed to be done. So Father, I pray this morning your will would be done in the heart of every person here. Thank you for sending Jesus. We pray it in his name. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing a Christmas song in closing. Oh, come.